this very strange period that we're in. I'm just going to fire up the presentation and see if I can manage to share. After a year, you'd think it would just be second nature. There we go. And there we go. So, um, yeah, the uh, Q plus is the latest in our line of uh, quartz family instruments. Uh, the uh, family really has a selection of pressure-based uh, sea level and uh, tide and wave uh, recorders that are all based around quartz-based pressure gauges as opposed to the more economical piezo-resistive gauges uh, that are used in our uh, solo and duet families. Um, the history of this instrument uh, or its siblings um, include uh, the quartz BPR for bottom pressure recordings and the APT, which is an accelerometer uh, or tilt meter uh, that's good to about uh, 16 hertz. However, the Q plus is so named because it's the larger member of the Q family. Uh, the Q family of which, of course, I uh, forgot to bring one with me. Um, but uh, both of them have a very similar functionality in terms of high accuracy and high resolution measurements uh, intended both in uh, sea level but also tide and wave recordings for shallow waters. And by shallow, we mean less than about 300 meters. Uh, the key features, uh, as you can see here, are not only the quartz based sensor. Um, but, uh, but also the fact that the PID Plus is really intended for long-term deployments up to many years and has been had considerable rework done of the design to make it exceptionally easy to use. And uh, PowerPoints are, are fun and everything like that, but what I'd really like to get to and what I'll do at the end is to show you the actual instrument, uh, which you may just be able to see is lurking behind me in the box. So what is the, the big deal about a pressure sensor that's uh, made of quartz? Well, first of all, let's start off by saying, what's the alternative? And the alternative literally is to use a solid state uh, pressure sensor based on the principle of a Wheatstone bridge uh, that's piezo resistive in nature. And that is to say, there is a small silicon uh, sensing element that in this cutaway of a uh, classical pressure gauge is the smallest white rectangle that you can find in the center of the image. Uh, that silicon is sitting in uh, a bath of oil. And the oil is there to protect the silicon from whatever media you're measuring the pressure of. And in our case, it's salt water, um, but it might be corrosive fluids of some other kind as well. And that silicon has been uh, cut from behind so that there's a very thin uh, element of this uh, disc left. And the silicon flexes uh, very slightly because silicon is, is extremely stiff, but it flexes very slightly with pressure. And it's instrumented really as a strain gauge. Uh, those fine wires that you can see are labeled as contact wires. Uh, those are bonded onto it. And then they come out through the header or the glass feed throughs. Um, what separates the oil from the media itself is uh, known to us as a diaphragm. And you can see in the cross section, it has uh, ribs on it. In the photograph at the bottom right, you can see those are kind of concentric. And those are intended to make sure that the pressure is transmitted from the external media through to the pressure sensor without any kind of uh, smoothing or low pass filtering. And so that ensures that the metal can remain elastic and never experience any plastic deformation. We typically use Haskoy, which is a nickel-based super alloy as that diaphragm material. Um, it's often used in aircraft engines and uh, other marine applications because it's, it's almost completely corrosion resistant. Stainless steel, despite the name stainless, isn't very stainless at all. And so we always want to use uh, something like Hastoloy, or uh, in some of our other sensors, we use titanium as the diaphragm material. Here's a resistive sensors are quite economical. Uh, their accuracy is moderate. Um, 
typically off the shelf, you might be able to mine them at about 0.1%. We calibrate ours over a range of temperature to achieve 0.05%. And that percentage is a percent of full scale value. So it depends on the pressure range that you're going for. We have almost 10 pressure ranges available in piezo resistive gauges. And you always want to pick the one that's most suitable. And their resolution is uh, also moderate. Uh, so for their application, uh, they, they are absolutely the right thing to do. But if you're looking really to get a best of breed solution for uh, particularly long-term monitoring, uh, when it comes to critical parameters like sea level rise, then a quartz based sensor is far superior. Um, we call them euphemistically less economical. That is to say they're expensive. Uh, their accuracy is usually about five times better, 0.01% full scale. And the resolution uh, is uh, much superior. It's not as critical in these shallow water deployments because you tend to be averaging over uh, many, many wave cycles to try and get a, a reading that's independent of the, the local sea state. Uh, but in our bottom pressure recorders, for instance, we have resolutions of 10 parts per billion. That's about the same as saying uh, 10 microns of, uh, sorry, 100 microns of water level change when measured from 1,000 meters below the surface. Uh, in the shallow water instruments, the resolution is, is not as critical. Uh, it's really the accuracy that covers you. And the quartz based sensors also have much lower drift than piezo resistant ones do. The shallow deployments of a quartz based sensor uh, are typically implemented with a bellows type transducer. Uh, and you saw in the previous photo the kind of box uh, design to the upper right. That is the shallow uh, parascientific gauge that we use with its buffer tube out in front. Um, and these, this is the principle of how that operates. You can see that these bellows uh, expand and contract according to the pressure that's applied to them. And in an analog gauge, uh, you can have some kind of mechanical linkage to cause a needle to move. Um, in a solid state gauge, uh, then we use the quartz crystal to uh, detect the strain across those bellows. Uh, quartz crystals have a resonant frequency, as you may recall from your digital watch. And that tends to be reasonably stable but it turns out that they are sensitive, that resonant frequency will change if you stretch them. Now, unfortunately, it also changes, or fortunately, depending on how you think about it, proportional to temperature. And so you need to also, as well as measuring the pressure, uh, you need to have an independent temperature sensor so that you can correct your pressure gauge so it doesn't just become a very fancy thermometer. Uh, here is uh, the kind of representation of how those electrodes are placed onto the quartz crystal. And uh, the left-hand uh, example is, you can really think of it as a, a twin tuning fork, if you like. Um, and the right-hand example is one where the tuning fork has no applied load to it. And so you are seeing the measurement only corresponding, the variations occur only with temperature. So what is the quartz Q plus? in terms of its measurement specifications. Well, as I said, we have a number of pressure ranges below 300 dBar or 300 meters equivalent. Uh, the initial accuracy is 0.01% of that full scale. And that resolution uh, is uh, on these instruments, 100 parts per billion. And that you should be careful because uh, it is a function of the integration time. And so we give you that spec at the 16 Hertz rate, which is the fastest that the instrument can operate. This instrument also has a completely uh, independent temperature channel, not only the one that I referred to for compensation, but a marine temperature channel. And that's over our classic range of minus five to 35 with a two milligray, uh, milligree accuracy. We embed that into the sensor end cap of the instrument so there's nothing sticking out uh, prone to being damaged. And it has a time constant of about 30 seconds. In terms of the physical specification, uh, we've dramatically increased the autonomy of this instrument through using 24 D cells. Uh, these can either be outline uh, cells, the ones that are readily available for you in your corner of the world, 
out. Um, Duracell, Rayovac, Energizer, um, Green Energy Battery Company, whatever it may be. Uh, but they could also be lithium thionyl chloride. And uh, per cubic centimeter, per unit volume, lithium thionyl chloride tends to have about three times the capacity of alkalines. So it really improves your uh, deployment autonomy if you can do it. The reason that we've done individual D cells, as you'll see, is that it allows you to ship those lithium batteries. Uh, one, we can deliver the instrument with those batteries inside it, uh, but we can also, and you can obtain, individual D cells blister packed and ship those around the world without the same hazards that you do if you were to assemble a shrimp wrapped pack. And so we're trying to move away from uh, a custom battery pack idea to individual D cells while still making them easy to change and easy to manage. You can externally power this instrument in addition. So if you wanted to use it in a real time situation, you can supply anywhere from four and a half to 30 volts. And you can talk to it while it's shut with either USB or RS232 or RS485. It's about uh, 15, 14 millimeters, 14 centimeters uh, in diameter, as you'll see. And uh, because of the batteries, it weighs almost 12 kilos in air. Uh, however, we've made it uh, not significantly, uh, we've included enough air inside for free that it's only about three kilograms uh, negative in water. In terms of deployment lifetime, so on the lithium uh, thionyl chloride batteries, uh, for instance, you will typically see figures that are anywhere up to three times longer than the outline. Um, the first example here is if you were to do a burst of, let's say, 4,000 uh, samples, each uh, of those bursts will run at four hertz, and you do that every two hours, then you'll get roughly the same lifetime on both uh, of those battery types. And that is because with 88 million samples, uh, the battery uh, is not the limiting factor, it's the memory. Uh, the same is still true at one hertz and uh, 512 samples over 30 minutes. Outline will still get you a four year deployment. A lithium will get you a full 10 years or perhaps even slightly longer. And the lifetime of a lithium battery is about 10 years. And so that's achievable. There are some people who like to deploy them and then go and retire and leave it to their next PhD student to recover. Um, finally, if you were just to do one hertz continuous measurements, uh, then you'll see that you still get about a three year measurement out of lithium thionyl chloride batteries. And even with outline, uh, you'll run for a year and, and record 33 million samples. This little uh, rendering on the right gives you a sneak peek of uh, how the instrument comes apart, but we'll talk about that. Uh, in a second. And that is really that we, we don't ship RVR instruments um, requiring tools that need uh, to be used to open them. We want to make every instrument that we make uh, able to be opened using your hands uh, without having forgotten the essential Allen key, whether it's metric or imperial or particular screwdrivers or worse, some injection molded um, tool that's customized to the particular instrument. And so the, the quartz is designed so that you can pull the batteries out uh, using these folding handles at the top. I think really it's much more interesting to, uh, to show you the real thing. Um, so I am going to stop my share and uh, do that instead. And Krista, if you wouldn't mind gathering at least a few of those back in. So, um, in fact, we'll leave it for, I'll pick that up myself in a minute and uh, you can bring the camera over instead. I have a naval assistant, Krista, who is behind the camera, who is, uh, I'm not just talking to myself, although I do a lot of that too. Um, so, this is the RBR quartz. Uh, the case is actually designed for uh, two of them, but we've just got one of them in here at the moment. So, the instrument itself comes out. Uh, there's a stand built into the case, um, and you can do that. Uh, there's a secondary stand as well, if you uh, want to put it down on your desk. And uh, the reason that you might want to stand it on that end um, is to get at the connectors. And of course, you can also flip it. Those connectors would usually cause things fall over, but it won't. And this is the business end where the sensors 
and um, uh, where the sensors are located. In terms of getting the instrument open, the um, the thumb taps press down and the handles come off and the instrument opens like that. Um, these are alkaline D cells that we've brought in today. Um, they could be the lithium final chloride and the desiccant is contained on the bottom. Recently, RVR has been able to move to completely reusable desiccant packs. And so these are color indicating desiccant. They're orange or pale orange when they're dry and they turn green and uh, they, uh, when they're moist. And I'll show you a little bit more about how you recharge those in a second. Now, inside the instrument itself, there's really nothing to see. And so do that. Uh, there is only a small USB-C uh, connector down at the far end and the mating connector for the electronics. You don't have to worry about uh, putting this back together in the right orientation. It won't go in anything except the right orientation. And when it's latched, then you can pick it up by the handles and carry it away. In the uh, support kit that comes with the instruments, um, we have uh, everything you need for ensuring that you can service um, the, uh, the pressure sensor and so we, we start off with the USB-C cables, some spare O-rings, silicon grease, uh, syringe, um, and uh, a calibration adapter uh, that is, uh, is used when you want to put a deadweight tester onto the end of the instrument. Uh, that's the only time really when you're going to need to use tools is to uh, apply pressure without seawater. We also have some extra buffer fluid there. Uh, which is just a uh, down corning and uh, an O-ring removal tool that is helpful just to help you remember that you don't need to uh, use a screwdriver to gouge your, your O-ring screws. So that's a, a very quick walkthrough uh, of the instrument. Uh, we're very happy to say that we've, uh, although this is the launch, uh, we have already shipped this. Um, and uh, some very positive feedback from users on the, the first deployments. And uh, at that point, having kept it short and sweet for the Zoom uh, uh, fatigue that's setting in around the world, um, I'd like to turn it over and see if there are any questions that uh, can answer. That's wonderful. Uh, I, I love looking at this instrument. It's such a, uh, I don't know, piece of cool engineering, uh, apart from being a fantastic uh, actual measurement instrument. Um, a, a quick question before we go into, actually, I, this, I was going to ask this question, but uh, Pavan or Pavan uh, Vutukur has just asked, how are the batteries held in place along uh, the actual... Yes, I should show, because this is actually an, another piece of uh, mechanical ingenuity. So uh, the batteries are held in place by the cylinder itself uh, when deployed, but when they're open like this, they uh, can just be popped out and they are spring loaded as you'd expect. Um, and I could take out all of the different channels, but to avoid them all falling on the ground, you'll notice that actually we have a little piece of magic here, which is known as a magnet. And so the batteries are held in place and retained uh, so that it's very easy to add them and fill up the channel. And we have six columns of uh, four cells each. Ah, excellent. So yeah, they, they, the magnets are embedded in the actual center column. Uh, they are, they're not, uh, they're not embedded in the batteries. That's, a, <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah, it's, it is a nice design. And, you know, what would you say, Greg, is the advantage of having this type of design, this type of batteries versus having kind of a custom made wrapped uh, type of battery packs? Well, we do have some shrimp wrap packs uh, that we use in some of our pure battery containers, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't like to keep people hostage to using either custom batteries or custom cables. That's why we use USB-C everywhere. 
And that's why previous to this, we used to use the Apple iPhone connector that Apple agreed to distribute around the world for us. Um, the uh, intention is never to force you to come back to RBR to buy any of your consumable supplies. And so the battery packs that we did make, we actually give you the drawings so that you can go to a local manufacturer and have them shrink wrapped, fused and uh, um, uh, diode protected. Um, and we will continue to do that for those instruments, but these are even simpler. You just go to your local battery supplier and uh, purchase the batteries uh, individually and put them into the carousel. Wonderful. Uh, so Carlo Rea, I think right there in the Ontario region, asked, uh, how do you protect the transducer from overpressure shock? Uh, so the, uh, uh, in terms of, so two things, in terms of protecting it from shock, uh, it has a buffer tube uh, in front of it. Uh, that's a curl tube, looks like a pigtail really. Um, and the, uh, to prevent it from overpressure is really the responsibility of the user. So if you have a 250 meter sensor, don't lower it and deploy it on the seafloor at a thousand meters. Uh, that makes it uh, considerably harder to use. Now, most of these Paros transducers have an overpressure rating before damage occurs of about 20%. Um, so it's not actually the housing that's going to get damaged, it is the Paros itself. Um, on our piezo-resistive sensors, we tend to use a slightly bigger margin of about 50%, sometimes even as high as 100%. Uh, so those are the two mechanisms. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, you're welcome, fellow. So we also have uh, well, two questions, but the first one, are, oh no, it's two questions in, in one paragraph. There we go. From Glenn Sasagawa. Uh, hi, Glenn. Um, the first one is, is there a tilt measurement? So uh, I omitted to, to, uh, to mention that. Uh, we do have a tilt sensor, uh, which is optional to add in. It gets hidden in the bottom of this instrument. And uh, this is really the same as our bottom pressure recorder. So people who deploy the instrument um, using one of the kind of classical orientation, um, sorry, flip it on. Those together. So the handles are cut flat with the side of the cylinder so that it can be deployed on a, uh, a seafloor frame uh, without any concern. And you really, uh, if you put the label up so that you can see it, then the instrument has been uh, calibrated in that orientation, or you can make the head adjustment for the orientation. And um, you'll actually see that the pressure sensor is exactly on the midline of the instrument. However, with the optional tilt sensor added, uh, then you can also have continuous X, Y, Z readings of the local gravity vector. Uh, so you can deploy it on any orientation you like. There's no particular orientation that's worse or better. Um, so if you want to deploy it on a, a tripod uh, vertically this way, or indeed, I mean, quote unquote, with upside down, um, you're welcome to do both. And that tilt sensor is, uh, is a silicon-based tilt sensor. And because it's a local gravity vector, uh, the drift is, is really taken into account of that by knowing that gravity is, is uh, pretty uniformly 1G. Um, around the planet. On our deep water instruments, uh, like the BPR plan, uh, then we use the parascientific triax accelerometer, and that works, as you know, very well as a, a tilt sensor good to the nano radians, um, but it increases the, uh, the price of the instrument by uh, uh, an enormous factor. And so that's really only used in the seafloor GRC uh, world, as opposed to the top a uh, few hundred D-bar. Great. Uh, the second question from Glenn is, what are the concerns with biofouling? So um, biofouling affects the temperature measurement almost not at all, um, but it can affect the pressure sensor. And so we put a cuprous nickel mesh on the end of the sensor. Now you can't quite see that there. Perhaps it's uh, difficult in the icon. Um, so just to give you a clear heads up, this is the pressure inlet here. This is the pressure relief valve, so that if there ever was a leak and the batteries were flooded and started to generate gas or expanded, that would be vented through this. And this is the internal temperature sensor. 
Uh, this pressure sensor, uh, the, the mesh is Cooper's nickel. And so the anti fouling from that is, is pretty effective. And there's a uh, split ring that holds that in place so that you can replace it if you need to repurge uh, and rebuild the oil. Great. Uh, there's also a question from Dinesh. Hello, Dinesh. Um, long term measurement regime is quite interesting. Do we have someone already using this piece of equipment and or its predecessor over a long period? Uh, yes, so we have uh, many people who have uh, members of the Q family in long-term deployment, even from before they were called the Q family. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, Earl Davis and the Pacific Geoscience Center in Canada um, has been instrumenting, gosh, we have instruments down on the cork uh, uh, holes, uh, that is to say the ocean drilling project holes. Um, that have been deployed for 15 years, also based on parascientific technology. Um, really, this instrument is a shallow water version of the, the same uh, electronics that we've been making for um, so are the frequency counting electronics that we do to handle the parascientific. Um, we've made them for at least eight years at this point in the particular form factor that we do now. So uh, we don't have the data, um, but there are many people who have deployed this. The shallow water instruments are much more recent for us. Um, I know that I think probably the, uh, the first five systems are actually uh, in France at the moment um, and uh, are with the, uh, the French National Research Center, CNRS. And with Sean as well. Ah, yes, which is the uh, hydrographic service of the French Navy. Right. Uh, I believe that in Australia also, they have uh, been used extensively. Yeah. Uh, uh, Manly Hydraulics uh, has had some instruments that uh, I think we even, Steph and I hand delivered uh, about a decade ago. Um, and uh, recalibration of parascientifics is very straightforward because they really only require an offset adjustment. You don't have to carry across the multiple scale. So uh, a single zero offset measurement is, is straightforward. Yeah, and that was, that was actually the next question from Grant uh, Rawson. Uh, how often does an instrument require calibration? And I think you... Uh, so we typically, to maintain data sheet uh, specs, would say uh, deploy, re recalibrate an instrument once a year. Um, however, with the parascientific, uh, the drift trigger is slightly harder to come up with. We would still normally say uh, once a year. Um, and for, uh, for this one, the reason for shipping that calibration adapter is that it allows you to, uh, to do that full test in your own lab. Um, however, you are welcome to ship it back to us and we'll do that for you. Or indeed any well-qualified pressure calibrator locally, a Transcat or Transcal lab. Uh, around the world can do these kinds of calibrations for you. Right. Um, going back, I, I missed, I think uh, one of Dinesh's questions was, um, we may want our customers to look at the possibility of integrating ports in their tsunami sensor packaging. Um, yeah, I would say that would go then into the BPR, uh, the quartz BPR series. That's right. Most tsunami detection applications are in deep water to give you advance notice uh, so that you can get the message from the deployment site back to shore using radio signals traveling much faster than the tsunami approaches. Um, so the Q and the Q plus are really only intended for shallow water deployments down to 300 meters. The BPR, the bottom pressure recorder, is in a titanium case um, and uh, we have a zero drift uh, variety of that called the BPR zero. Um, it uses the so-called A0A technique to reduce the drift long term. That's not actually critical for tsunami detection because you're looking for very small relative changes. And that's where the resolution really comes into play that you can deploy at uh, four kilometers, for instance, and still see a tsunami, which may only be a few millimeters in height at that point, crossing over the top. So for tsunami detections, uh, the same principles, uh, but a different instrument form factor, and that would be the quartz BPR. All right.
right. Um, we have another question here. It's a direct message. Uh, do we have the possibility to connect the Words Q Plus to real time? Absolutely. So on the top, um, we have two connectors. And uh, you can probably see they've eventually been embossed. One is serial, one is USB. Through either of them, you can apply 12 volt power uh, for that nominal 12 volt for an hour for 30. Um, and they are MCBH connectors. Uh, we use six pins on all our instruments. And so on this side, uh, you can request either RS232 or RS485. 232 is good to about 100 meters or so. RS-485, um, it's really as long as your budget supports, up to a kilometer, I would say. And then the other side is USB, and that is the same as the USB-C connector on the inside. Um, that is not one that we would uh, recommend trying to run anything longer than a couple of meters, uh, but it does allow you to uh, recover the instrument, download the data without opening it at all. And um, we have some patch cables for that purpose. Um, so here is the one that can be used uh, with this MCIL we plugged in there. And that's the straight serial with a DB9 connector. Uh, we then have one for serial, where again, you plug in the serial side, but it has the serial dongle built in. So you've got USB on the other side. And then uh, this one, which plugs into the USB side and is native USB. And so any of the others can actually be extended. We have underwater extension cables, but the USB one should really just remain at this length, which is two meters. And, uh, and that's just for local download and attaching to the computer. Right, and they can also use the uh, standard USB-C that is included in the support clip. That's right. Um, so a desktop cable can be used when you're in the dry and, uh, and willing to open the instrument. Um, but if you're on the deck of a, a small boat then, uh, and you're getting splashed, then certainly something like a Panasonic Toughbook or a, a waterproof laptop uh, and uh, one of those is all you need. Great. I'll also show you the inside of the uh, desk and pills while well, I've got them. Um, here is one, and you can pop the caps off. And maybe I can just show you. Yeah, there's the desiccant, uh, little silica balls. And uh, by popping them off, you can put them, uh, pop them into a microwave, um, or better yet, is to put them into a, a low temperature uh, setting on your oven. So we can see 100 degrees Celsius, probably around 100 is, is okay. And um, certainly don't try to dry them while they're still in their capsule. And the capsule tends to uh, deform into all sorts of fun shapes. Um, how, long do they need, how long will they need to bake? Uh, until they return to this color, um, I would say that's usually 20 minutes, half an hour. I'm sure our, we have an application note that tells you the exact number. Right. Okay, so we don't have any more questions in the queue. So I invite everyone uh, to just have a discussion if you want to turn on your video and join us and we can uh, have a chat. Uh, you know, this uh, ends the formal part of the, the presentation, but really we're here for uh, a while and welcome you to ask further questions online or through the chat and we'll answer uh, about the, Q, the Quartz Q Plus and any of our other instruments if you have questions as well. We'll stay as long as it takes me to pick up all the desiccant I dropped on the table. <laughs> there we go. It's nice to see so many people. You want to drop off that camera and I'll go to the... Hey, thank you for the presentation. Have a good day. Take care. Thank you. Um, actually, there's... Uh, uh, a question from Pavan. Um, it is uh, from you're from the uh, Oregon State University. Hello, Pavan. Um, is a one second continuous sampling interval from the DigiQuart sensor calculated as an average of n measurements every second? 
resolution? No. No. Okay. No, the uh, uh, the instrument is always running um, because this is intended for shallow water measurements. The instrument is always running um, at uh, an integration time that's considerably shorter, about a sixteenth of a second. And uh, that's why the resolution on this instrument is only 100 parts per billion, as opposed to the 10 parts per billion of the, uh, the quartz BPR, the deep water instrument. So uh, the integration time is kept quite short. Um, if you, we uh, run at one hertz, we do actually power up the uh, sensor and, and keep that power on it because quartz crystals take a little while to, uh, to settle down once you turn them on. Great. Um, any other questions? Good to see you, Wolfkin. Wipke, nice to see you. Jose Maria. Hello. How are you? Okay, I'm basically finished with the desk and Paul, so why don't we wrap it up there? Uh, you picked them all up, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thanks, Greg. It was a great presentation and I uh, look forward to seeing you again later today, this evening. Good. And if you feel like coming on video as you say goodbye, great to see some uh, familiar names and, and faces. We're gonna stop recording now, there we go.